it's so good to see you. I am actually really passionate about the fact that we can be together again in the room. It's so good, isn't it? And um, yeah, it's great to see you this morning. Our passage that we're going to look at this morning is finishing off our series, Just Love. And uh, we're going to be looking at the parable of the persistent widow, Luke 18. So if you've got a Bible with you, or if you want to look it up on your phone to follow along, it's Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about what people think, Yet because this, with this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? And I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? On the earth. Now, in this story, there's two characters. There's the judge, who is basically not bothered about serving justice at all. He's not bothering about doing what's right. He doesn't care about doing the right thing, and he doesn't even care what other people think about him. And then there's the widow. Now, in those days, women weren't viewed very highly at all. In fact, a woman couldn't even go into a courtroom. She wouldn't be allowed to speak. And you've got this woman whose husband had died, so a widow in those days were really vulnerable, particularly economically, particularly if they didn't have any sons. And we don't know the details of this dispute, but we do know that she was suffering an issue of injustice. Most likely she was poor because... Again, in those days, judges often would go from town to town, and they'd often take bribes from people to be able to rule favorably in those that had paid them to come. So she obviously had nothing to give. She had no money to bring apart from this consistent, persistent determination for justice. And in the end, she succeeded, not because the judge woke up and had some sort of moral change of heart, but because uh, he was only concerned with his well-being, and he just wanted to get rid of her. Now, I think when you look at this passage, it's got a really strong opener, hasn't it, this story. It says, always pray and don't give up. Now, I've got to confess, when I read that, I just feel like I don't start out very well. I feel really challenged by those two words, always pray. And uh, always means every time, on every occasion, without exception, all the time. And um, I know I'm supposed to, and I know that prayer makes a difference, but also, I, lo I love lists. As well as love talking about the weather, I love lists. I love to make a list, and I love to be able to cross off things that I've got to do because it makes me feel a sense of progress. Anybody else in the room love a list? I love, yeah, list lovers. Um, and, uh, and it makes me feel like there's some progress, that I'm actually achieving something, that I'm going to see a bit of change. But what I often miss is that in order to see progress, in order to see that change that I'm longing for, um, for circumstances either in my life or in the lives of those around me, the most significant thing I can actually do is to pray, is to start praying. But why do we pray? Well, Jesus prayed. Um, the speaker and author, Philip Yancey, in his book, Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference, writes this. He says, the Son of God who had spoken words into being and sustains all that exists, felt a compelling need to pray. He prayed as if it made a difference, as if the time devoted to prayer mattered every bit as much as the time he devoted to caring for people. And Jesus taught us to do the same. He says in Matthew 6, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. He doesn't start by saying, if you pray, but he says, when you pray. There's an assumption that we're going to pray. And that's because we were all created for this relationship. Alongside hope and hug, 
the word prayer reached a record high on the Google searches in, um, on the Google, do you say the Google? I'll go show my age. On the World Wide Web, on the internet, on Tinternet, it reached a record high in 2020. Because it's a really natural thing to do for human beings to pray, particularly when we're in a crisis. I once heard of this guy who was an atheist, a complete unbeliever, and he fell off the edge of a cliff. And as he fell off the edge of the cliff, he managed to grab hold of this tuft of grass. And he was hanging off this tuft of grass. He was looking down 250 feet above rocks. And uh, as this complete unbeliever, he was desperate. And he just said, God, if you're there, help me. And then he heard this voice and saying, I am here. Let go of the grass and trust in me. And then the man said, is there anyone else? I'm here all day, everyone. I'm here all day. Um, Jesus is clearly saying that prayer is not an optional thing for us. It's not an extra or an add-on, but it's an absolutely indispensable and vital for, for every single one of us. But how? How do we pray? God invites us to pray plainly and persistently about our problems. He just wants us to be real, just wants us to be honest, to speak with him as, as if we were a friend. And I know that there are some people that I talk to about prayer and they just say, oh, God's got, God's got loads of stuff that he needs to be dealing with. He doesn't need to be listening to my prayers. Like, what does it really, am I a bit selfish? Am I taking up his time, even bothering him with the things that I'm thinking about and worried about, my needs or desires? But this story shows us that God is interested And actually, there's so many stories throughout the whole of the Bible that show us that God is interested. A woman who wants a baby but is struggling to conceive. A widow who needs more oil. A soldier who begs for victory in a battle. People praying for rain during a doubt. The Lord's Prayer itself says, ask for food. You know, give us our daily bread. The Apostle Apostle Paul, he he prays for safe travel, for prosperous work for relief from physical pain and discomfort, and for boldness in preaching. I was praying that this morning. Lord, help me. And James urges his readers, and he just says, pray for wisdom and physical healing. It seems that God is interested in all our problems, in all our worries, in all our cares, in all of our lives, in your life and my life, the big things and the small. And then what, what, what about where we pray? Well, wherever we are. I know for me, I don't like to take my feet out of the bed in the morning until I've started praying. I pray when I'm getting dressed. I pray when I'm getting up in the morning. Um, I pray when I go to bed at night, the last thing I do at night. When I'm walking, you can pray whether you're walking, whether you're sitting, whether you're dancing, whether you're painting, whether you're on the bus, whether you're on the tube, whether you're driving, although maybe if you're driving, don't close your eyes and put your hands together, perhaps. But whether you're shopping, whether you're swimming, whatever it might be, you can pray, pray, pray wherever you are. And that's the, only, that's the first part of the verse. We haven't even got to the second part of verse one yet. And it says, and not give up. And I just think, well, I didn't, I didn't feel really inadequate now. Always pray. Like, I really do now. And not give up. Because I'm really well aware of circumstances where I have got tired, where I have given up, of people or situations where I've just, for whatever reason, whether it's discouragement, disillusionment, More likely, distraction, actually, and I've not kept going in prayer. And I think, you know, that that where it says, you know, and don't give up, it feels to me a little bit on a par with when people say, you know, and cheer up. I had this, um, I had this time a a little while ago, and I was walking down the road, and this guy walks past me, and he just goes, oh, cheer up, love. And so I just found it so annoying, mainly because I was actually feeling completely fine. Like, that's the irony of it, was I was actually completely fine until he said, cheer up, love. And then I felt really annoyed and really angry. And I thought, if you hadn't said that to me, and then I go into this whole thing of, like, Christian condemnation, because I think, I'm not, I'm obviously not exuding the love of God enough or the light of Christ. But it really annoyed me. But I think sometimes when someone says to you, don't give up, it can feel a little bit like that. Oh, cheer up. And you just think, oh, is that a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit irritating. Maybe you're close to giving up. Maybe there's things that you've been praying about, but actually you're feeling, you're feeling weary. You're feeling tired. Perhaps it's a breakthrough for something around, around work, children, relationships, your health maybe. But this is an encouragement to keep going. So why does Jesus tell us to always pray and not give up? 
I was, as I was looking through this, in my Bible, I highlighted at least 15 times, just literally when I skimmed through the New Testament, looking at prayer, is I highlighted 15 times where it says, ask. Ask and it will be given to you. If you believe you receive whenever you ask for in prayer, I will do whatever you ask in my name. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Ask and you will receive. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask. You do not have because you do not ask. Ask, ask, ask. That's what the Bible is saying. It's encouragement and invitation to ask. I'm sure as you know, um, a parable in the story is, uh, a parable in the Bible is, is a story with a point or an insight. And there are two types of parable. There's the comparing parable, saying God is like this. And there's the contrasting parable, saying God is not like this. And uh, when I was 14, there was this guy, quite a bit older than me, he was 19. He kept asking me out. And um, I didn't I didn't even really sort of like him that much. He kept asking me out. It's like, oh, you know, you get on, you get. Eventually, I said yes, which I sort of took myself by surprise a little bit, really. I just thought, oh, all right then. But sort of slightly worn down by it. And, um, and then eventually, probably we were sort of seeing each other on and off for about two years. And then he actually started seeing somebody else behind my back at the end. So that sort of end, ended that. Although, to be honest, I'm not sure it was going to go anywhere anyway. I didn't really like him enough, although I was you know, gutted when he sort of started seeing somebody else. But also, he was in and out of prison quite a lot. And my um, husband, uh, my dad, sorry, is a police officer, so I'm not sure that match was ever really going to work. But it was sort of a bit strange, you know, like, but I kind of said yes, because he kept asking. But this story isn't a comparable parable. It's a contrasting parable. God is not like this judge who will only grant justice if we wear him out. God is not a vending machine. God is not a genie who, if we just, you know, rub the lamp, will give us a a limited number of wishes. Prayer is is not about a formula, but it's about a friendship. And this parable is about prayer, and it's about praying for justice, but it's also about who we pray to. This is what this parable is teaching. Who is it that we're praying to? And it's tempting. Sometimes, I don't know how you feel, whether every time you pray, it feels like those arcade games. I think they're called coin pushers. You know, when you put another coin in, maybe it will just tip the balance. By the way, anyone who likes those kind of things, they're totally rigged by the operator. So they will only go every so often if you're just thinking, now I'm going to keep putting that coin in. Maybe sometimes prayer to you feels a bit like that. One more prayer. Will it tip the balance? But God is not that a sort of operator of the universe. He's a God who loves you. He's a God who cares for you. So I think this passage shows us three ways to always pray and not give up. First, fix your eyes on him. Prayer keeps our attention on God. The greatest gift that we can actually give anyone is our attention. I know when my boys were little, I've got four boys, and they used to, all of them used to love this exact same nursery rhyme. And it goes like this. Um, Two little apples, I forgot it for a minute. Two little apples fresh from the tree. One little cherry as ripe as can be. I do it on their noses, not mine, their face. And then two little black currants looking at me. Two little apples fresh from the tree. One little cherry as ripe as can be. Two little black currants looking at me. And they loved it, not because it's some sort of knockout Shakespeare, but because they loved having my attention. They loved that face-to-face, eyes fixed on eyes. They absolutely adored it. Attention is your time. Your time is your life. God wants our attention. And when we pray, our eyes are fixed on him. The second way to always pray and not give up is to give your heart to him. We know that when we pray, we become more like Jesus. And persevering, waiting, grows patience and faith in us. James 1, verse 3 and 4 says, The testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. But life's testing, isn't it? Life is testing, and this year has been no exception. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever difficulties you're facing, whatever's worrying you, 
keeping you up at night. It's hard, isn't it, when you feel like, Lord, do you hear? Do you care? Are you answering my prayers? Maybe you feel like God is absent and you're wondering where he is in this situation, that you're not seeing answer to your prayers. But what strikes me is that Jesus himself even knows what it is to have prayers unanswered. He prays for all the believers to be brought to complete unity. And we're not, we're not there yet. We're not quite there yet. So even Jesus himself, know, himself knows it, what it is to have unanswered prayer. And yet God always answers prayer. The answer could be yes, it could be no, or it could be wait. I mean, our attention span and ability to wait has decreased as the world around us is designed um, to, for us to be able to have everything in an instant, to respond in an instant. You know, we get frustrated, don't we, when there's a lag on the Wi-Fi. My boys, when they're playing PS4, they're like, oh, there's such a lag, there's such a lag, oh, I've been chucked out, thrown off. Or I know when I'm loading up a page on the internet, on the Google, um, if, it's not, if it's not coming up straight away, I'm just like, oh, for goodness sake, how long is this going to take? I could run a bath by now. You know, we're not, to be honest, we're just not very good at, at waiting, are we? And I mean, I like that getting things delivered the next day or even the same day. I don't know if you've ever done that when someone says, I can get this to you by 10 o'clock. I'm like, brilliant. But it's not good for our faith. It's not good for developing a sense of building that faith muscle in our relationship with God. And even when you look at the Bible, Jacob waited 14 years for the love of his life. Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years for their son. Moses waited 40 years for directions. Joseph waited for a dream. David waited for his destiny. Elizabeth and Zechariah, Anna and Simeon waited for their deliverer, the Messiah. But what seems like delay doesn't mean denial. Again, Philip Yancey writes, God who is timeless requires of us a mature faith that may, as it did for many of these, involve delays that seem like trials. Patience is a quality that can only, only develop through a passage of time. So we're to pray and not give up because God wants our hearts. And it's, it's our hearts, our hearts are the place where emotion and desires begin that drive action. Our heart is the seat of compassion and understanding. So we're to pray persistently to keep our, our attention on him, our eyes, so that we become more like him, our hearts. And the third reason God tells us always to pray and not give up is to live your life for him. With our eyes, our, our eyes are focused, fixed on him, and our attention directs our thinking. And then our thinking determines our actions. So whatever we're focused on, affects our thinking that leads to what we do, to how we live, to how we interact. And as we become more like Jesus, then we act for him. And even over, after over a year of connecting on Zoom or Teams or whatever it might be for many of us, we still often hear those words, you're on mute, don't you? You sort of think, have, have we learned yet how to take ourselves, you're on mute? And um, I think that still, as much as we hear it, sometimes maybe it feels like that's something we're saying a lot to God. God, are you on mute? Are you on mute? Are you speaking? But I can't hear you. And in Pete Gregg's book, God on Mute, all about unanswered prayer. If you've not read it, I really recommend it. He tells of a girl called Kelly. He says, my friend Kelly prayed so hard for a community of drug dealers and prostitutes in Mexico that eventually she became an answer to her own prayers and relocated from Tulsa, Oklahoma, to live among them. As a result, her prayers are now being dramatically answered in a way that they would not have been had if she had stayed home praying. At least one prostitute and one drug dealer have come to know Jesus in the past, uh, past year, thanks to Kelly's willingness to live out her prayers with integrity. In Jesus' story, the persistent widow was granted justice from an unjust judge. And we know that God is not like him. God is loving, he's kind, he's generous and just. He is a God of justice. And verse 7 says, And will God bring about justice for his chosen ones? That's for all who trust in Jesus, who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see to it that they get justice and quickly. Jesus 
came to bring freedom. Jesus came to bring justice. He himself was from an oppressed group. And are there situations in your life where you're longing for justice? You're just thinking, this isn't right. Are there particular people groups? Are there particular countries where you long to see justice? Prayer is not a substitute for action. The battle against injustice requires both prayer and prayerful action. The church in Acts prayed for guidance about caring for widows, then appointed deacons in order to free up other leaders for the vital act of prayer. The apostle Paul prayed for the early churches, but he also wrote and visited them. I was reading um, an article from IJM the other day, and they were saying, if we are to knock down the doors of sweatshops, brothels, fishing ships, and factories, we first need an army of people knocking on the door of heaven to bathe our teams, our investigators, our lawyers, social workers, and community, act community activists around the world in our Father's grace and wisdom. Prayer is that partnership between human and divine that accomplishes God's work on earth. Prayer is an opportunity to actually shift the facts on the ground. Prayer makes a difference. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is a cry for justice. And that's why we're joining in with the Archbishop of Canterbury's initiative, Thy Kingdom Come. As Anna said, it's the 11 days of prayer between Ascension and Pentecost on the 13th to the 23rd of May. We're going to be joining with millions of Christians around the world, 80 different denominations from different cultures, from different, different traditions. And as well as our weekly devoted prayer meeting happening on Thursday at 8 o'clock, as Anna said, we're going to have lunchtime prayer meetings. Kingdom Come at 1, just for 20 minutes. And then we'd love you to join us um, for an evening of prayer and worship and prophetic encounter on the 13th of May at 7.30 in person here at St. Mark's. And we're also going to be led in short prayers daily from different members of the congregation on Instagram. So if you want to join in with that, follow us on Instagram to join in. And there are some resources as well that you can have to take with you to pray over these next 11 days from Ascension to Pentecost um, as you go out. And we want to pray. We want to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for His Spirit to move within the church, to equip us to share God's love and to pay attention to how God is speaking to us today. I was... Um, Reading this recently, it was an article from Justin Welby in uh, writing for Premier magazine just 10 days ago. And he wrote this. For every nation on the planet, this is a time of extraordinary change. Technological developments that, were, that we expected within a decade have happened in six months. These changes will be revolutionary for most of us. They'll change the way we live, work, and learn. With change comes tension between the old and the new. Both are essential. We need to draw on and respect our past, but not get stuck in it. We need to look boldly and courageously to the world ahead. And he says, above all, look for signs of God at work in the world and get stuck in. There are hints of hope everywhere, bless you. Signals of God's love for us. If Christians are there where God is, restoring relationships, assuring love, and working towards justice, mercy, and peace, we might rebuild a post-COVID world that looks more like the kingdom of heaven. That's what this time, Thy Kingdom Come, is about, an opportunity for the church to gather as we come out of lockdown, as we come out and emerge into a new world as I say, prayer shifts the facts on the ground. So what a time to be praying. The end of that passage, verse 8, concludes with, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Out of all the challenges in this passage, I find this perhaps the most challenging question. Do we trust in him? Do we trust that he is able to bring justice? The ultimate judge over all things. What if the most significant thing you did with your life wasn't something you did, a task you achieved, but a prayer that you whispered? Fixing your eyes on him, giving your heart to him, and living your life for him. That's what each one of us is called to do, is invited to do. 
this week, Jo Mead, who's um, some of you will know on our finance team, she told me her, her story of this week, and she sent me an email. She's given me permission uh, to read it, to share it with you. She said, I suffered with lumbar spine problems since birth. Twice during my adolescent years, I aggravated my back, once being dragged by my horse, the second time bending over for a drink from a water fountain. My back became partially paralyzed, and I was unable to walk, sit, or stand as nerves were trapped. A couple of years ago, I started having problems again from running, and the jarring it caused. I can no longer run, which is upsetting. After numerous tests and scans, the results showed five issues with my lumbar spine, some degenerative. I knew I needed a miracle, as the results implied. I would end up in a wheelchair at some point in the future. Since then, I've had to sit on a cushion with a second lumbar spine support cushion behind my back, or the pain, or the pain becomes too great to remain sitting. I can't stand for long periods of time either. On Tuesday night, during the words of knowledge for healing at the leadership conference, I chose to believe God wanted to heal me too. During the prayer time, I felt the pain I was feeling in my lumbar spine at that moment disperse and go. In faith, I took the cushion I was sitting on away, and I've been able to sit without a cushion since then, which is huge. I still use the lumbar support cushion and have pain, but it's a different kind of pain. And I, and I know that something has shifted. I'm choosing to believe God has started my healing. I know that God sometimes chooses to heal instantaneously, and other times it takes persistent prayer. So I won't give up. And that's the encouragement for us today for you and for me, that we should always pray and not give up. In Jesus' name, amen.